So just to kind of tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, so we've uh, been working with just so many just incredible people of just all different types of backgrounds. Um, one big one being like the UFC, another one, uh, comedy, some celebrities. So we're like, all right, we have all these amazing people at our fingertips. Like we should be having conversations with them <laughs> and we should be talking about, um, because most of the time you see these, uh, these interviews people have and it's very high level it's like oh here's where i'm at now here's you know everything's going great but nobody talks about all the build-up nobody talks about all the stuff that happened beforehand so we wanted to create this to take all you know these amazing people and really kind of tell the story of the public success what the private work was and all the work that went into it um so that it kind of sheds light that it's not like overnight success that everybody thinks it's, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, it never is work. it never is yeah. And I, mean, I, I say that being I'm in the middle of one of those very big build through. <laughs> well, it might go through, it might not. We'll see how it goes, but yeah. That's so if you want to if you want to start off, um just kind of like tell us uh you know, you're just your quick uh pitch about yourself and then kind of uh what you're what you've been into and all that and then we'll kind of give Matt a little bit of background because I know a little bit already, but it'll fill him in now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure, sure. So, hi, I'm Jenna Pilgrim. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Streambed Media. Streambed is a um, publishing tool and analytics engine um, that helps creators um, and contributors to videos to um, link all of their content on the internet together. Um, and it uses the blockchain to do that. So, um, I got into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in 2015, um, which now is quite some time ago. Um, and um, that's how I kind of started my career. So I was, you know, 20 and broke and got a job working for Don Tapscott, who is the author of Wikinomics and a bunch of other books. But among other things, he wrote um, the book Blockchain Revolution. Um, and that ended up being the first kind of best selling book on blockchain, this new technology of how um, the world was going to be transformed by this sort of global public ledger. But it also came with, you know, the, you're talking about that was its, like, that was its sort of coming out party. But the lead up to that was really, really big for this all kinds of other stuff. So, um, but yeah, so I worked for um, him for a while, two and a half years. Um, and then um, in that time, we helped found the Blockchain Research Institute, which is a big um, think tank, global think tank, um, consulting to some of the largest companies and governments in the world um, about what this new technology would mean for businesses, for governments, for banks, for um, for democracy, for our global institutions, for nonprofits. It just it was this whole gamut of research. There was like 70 projects. Um, but the one gap that I found in all of these projects is that they didn't really address this like growing data problem, this like growing um, problem of data inequality, of, of privacy online, of, of people being able to, to take their identities back and then be able to, to use them to better plan their lives, to sell themselves better to brands, all kinds of other things. Um, and that's kind of where, where it was just like, oh, well, the magic of the blockchain is just gonna help all of that. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't really make sense. If you know about anything about new technologies, you don't, technologies don't create prosperity people do like technologies don't create companies people do um and so all of those things still have to be create or still had to be created um but i think the one thing that all of those places all of those companies touch banks governments nonprofits whatever they all touch video that's kind of the common denominator in all of these different um, industries is video and communications how we communicate our stories and the things that matter to us and then how do we collaborate with other people online and how do we sort of move forward from that so one of the researchers at the research institute was um michael casey and um he uh he wrote uh, the age of cryptocurrency which was the first best-selling book on bitcoin um and uh he was really thinking deeply he has a big media background journalism so story wall street journal award-winning journalist um and he was thinking really deeply about what this would mean for the media industry um, so push came to shove. I was ready to leave and write, you know, ready to go build something. Um, and so I, I left the research institute and did two things. Um, and how I met Christian is we worked together at Block. So um, Matthew Rozak is one of uh, Streambed, uh, my company's investors. Um, and 
um, investors and advisors. Um, and, um, you know, Matt brought me under the block kind of wing. Um, and um, I help him with some uh, partnership stuff and influencer marketing and a bunch of other things, um, special projects, really. Um, and uh, uh, then, you know, StreamBed became a real thing and it became too real to ignore. So Michael and I had founded this company in uh, June of 2018, um, and then I became the CEO in uh, November of last year, November 2019. So um, it's been a bit of a long haul, if you talk about long hauls. Um, but in looking for, Michael was the CEO, in looking for a new CEO, we realized there was no one better to run the company than someone who'd been there since the beginning. So um, that's that. We're a team of 14 now, um, and we're really concerned about how do we give power back to creators and how do we um how do we enable people to collaborate better online because the collaboration tools we have are good but they don't they only ever allow single creators they only ever allow the single publisher that's the person who gets all the information they're the alleyway to this sort of utopia of information that comes from creating videos and collaborating online so that's kind of my whole pitch i know there's like a lot to unpack there but oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, there's and then along the way i've been in a bunch of different founders communities i've i've I know a lot of people. I'm on a bunch of boards. You know the usual things that come along, but I just keep myself busy enough. Jenna is definitely one of those people who is uh, very humble in uh, explaining her connections. Um, <laughs> we went out one night when we were in Vegas and we were on a, a block kind of excursion, and uh, she goes, "Oh, do you want to go out after this and meet some people?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, sure." And like because she knew I was also running some side ventures, and she's like, "You know, I can introduce you to a few people, and you know, whatever." And so I'm thinking low level people like you know some guy maybe who works as an engineer at some company so she brings me up to this private suite in this club in vegas and she's like oh um okay so that's brock pierce this is this person this is this person this is this person and i'm like okay so collectively in the group i'm standing in right now is probably over maybe like 20 billion dollars maybe more <laughs> it's, all she's relative. Just, it's all relative she, money is money everyone yeah. puts pants on one leg at a time yeah, yeah. <laughs> the just, other uh, one, i thought you were good. i thought you were gonna tell a story about the, the night before that where it was like hey christian do you want to go to a party in a war bunker oh yeah My friends throwing a party in an apocalyptic <laughs> bunker would you like to go yeah. there yeah, I was like, didn't, oh, I didn't end up going, but wait, <laughs> belly steps in there, <laughs> special kind of party. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, she definitely oh, uh, has the unique uh, ability to really connect um, people and not just kind of like those half-assed connections that people usually give you where it's like, oh, yeah. here, meet this person, figure it out. It's like very succinct, exact connections that will really kind of move your business forward. Right. Stop it. <laughs> so then, um, <laughs> you in content creation beforehand or was it i was not no i am the i am the, the ceo of a content creation company who is not a content creator um we, <laughs> we have um well so that's the thing is i want to create to, tools to enable contributors really contributors is like a better word for it than creators it's not just professional creators like i'm i'm a contributor by contributing to this podcast right? Mm -hmm. Like our technology can be used to help me see how your podcast does online, right? Like that same, the same technology that creators would use to, to help connect them to other creators, to sponsors or to influencers or to whomever, um, can be used to, to help monetize contribution. Cause that's what it is. You're creating, but I'm creating in a different way. You're, you yeah. guys are creating by creating this podcast, but I'm creating by contributing my know knowledge or dollars or whatever to it so um but one key part of that is that stream has always been committed to being a content creation company as well we will never subscribe to the um to the build it and they will come mantra um yeah. that has failed in a lot of a lot of instances the most popular one especially in the the media space is civil where it's like here we're going to use create this journalistic thing where all these journalists in these old school newsrooms are going to use this. It's going to be powered by reputation, tokens, and all this other stuff. But then it just doesn't didn't make sense, and yeah, they right. didn't build it for the actual audience. So we have a division called Streamed Studios that produces original content. That Streamed is Streamed's tech is kind of a part of the story, but um, they produce intelligent content for Snapchat originals, and we're pitching um, Netflix in Africa. We're pitching a bunch of different things. So um, Jennifer Sanasi is the head of Streamed Studios, and she's famous in South Africa and has a big following on YouTube with her DIY fashion thing. I don't know if she'll, she'll be mad at me. For, she'll be mad at me for getting it wrong, but um, 
she has she has a bunch of followers online that like the things that she does and and she's been ingrained in that world for her whole career so we got enough yeah. got enough people in our corner i think yeah it's I obvious i'm sure one of the connect, one of the questions you probably get immediately when people when you pitch this is how does this compare to youtube like what is the the difference are they competitors is it so it's kind of if you were to compare us to what to to com companies that exist right now we're kind of like hootsuite meets google adwords on the block okay. so we're a tool suite mostly that's based on the fact that it shouldn't really matter where your media is posted or where it's viewed um for you to get all of the different analytics from it so you guys might post this podcast on youtube you might post it on the audio on spotify you might post um all the, it's kind of the TikTok philosophy where you're like it can be created one place but it can be shared all these different places mm -hmm. and realistically there are going to be if if distributed in all the places you could distribute this there could be 10 different versions of this podcast online right it could be an audio there could be one on youtube there could be one on vimeo there could be one on library which is the blockchain based youtube that is not really in use yet because it's very expensive um yeah. but yeah there's there's all kinds of different places but if you can aggregate a tool on top of that that just will let you publish to all of those places and then correlate all the data across the top then you're looking at one set of analytics instead of 10. okay that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And then, so what's the incentive then to use Streambed over kind of the existing tools or, I mean, what, cause obviously a lot of these companies that are coming out, I mean, we both know for sure is that everything is like, oh, it's this on the blockchain, but on it's like, yeah. yeah, do you yeah. need the blockchain? So what is the, so, what's the benefit this brings over existing tooling? Well, so the blockchain is a part of our story so much, as much as it, as far as it gets to public indexing. So Google is an index, Wikipedia is an index. Um, we use an index called the open index protocol, which we use the blockchain as a single source of truth in a public environment that lets us prove that someone created something at a specific point in time, and these are the other people who created with it. And then it can add transactions later to that, to those videos as more derivative content is posted. So it immutably links content to other content. That's what the blockchain is needed for. But okay. the consumer who's using it doesn't see the blockchain, they don't see the wallet on the back end, they don't pay any transaction fees, it's completely free to use, free to publish, free to whatever. It's, it's not like the, the monetization piece comes down the line when we have a uh, uh, an established user base then we can actually allow brands to play a role um, in in connecting to people once they have these sort of immutable profiles that publish to a bunch of different locations so that i'm not really concerned about it okay yeah so is it kind of like in a sense because i'm not in the realm of tech like you guys are <laughs> the most i know from tech is from reddit so that's yeah. my credentials <laughs> but uh, so, so they're pretty good credentials there's a lot of pretty interesting things on reddit so. there's a lot of interesting things on reddit yeah. there's a bunch of experts yeah, on there so, so if you there's <laughs> a lot of health experts on reddit right now oh, yeah. oh yeah 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 yeah. Tons of tons of medical advice. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Great place yeah, to look. Exactly. Like exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so if that's the case, is it in a way to help beat algorithms to where you're being at the whim of certain platforms like Instagram yeah. has their algorithm, YouTube has their algorithm, and it's trying to gear towards trends, but then creators are so independent at that point, being on stream bed, that if they keep creating original content, they're creating their own niche or their own quote unquote algorithm through their analytics. Is that kind of in the sense of how it works? Yeah, so it, it rewards people for tagging more people. So it, it rewards you for the amount of, and they're verified tags. That's the other part we need the blockchain for, is that mm -hmm. if I tag Christian in a video or, or you guys post this video and you tag me, I have to basically click a box from, a, like from my account that says, yes, that is me. And then, and then I am associating my image with someone else's image. And at the end of the day, the only way that we're going to like, quote unquote, beat the social media companies or, or take out, take our power back or create more power, however, however you want to look at it. The only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we're able to link ourselves together and then we become, because we're stronger together within our associations with one another, that becomes something that is too big to ignore. Um, and that at the end of the day is kind of our long game as to our long game is to create a new reputation mechanism on the internet. If we can have verified tags for people associating their audiences and their data and their profiles online with all of the other, you know, with all of the content that they produce and things that they want to lend their image to and they have to agree, 
then that creates a really consensual relationship between creators online, producers, sponsors. It's really good for like brands, like brand marketing and stuff. So a brand could sponsor this podcast and then you, um, uh, and then uh, a brand could have access to the same analytics that you guys see. And that's really good for you guys because then it allows brands to see a more clear ROI as to how, how the videos that they helped produce, they contributed to, can then uh, can perform in whatever location they please. We're trying to like, it doesn't really matter where videos are posted as long as all the, cre- all the contributors can see the relevant information. Yeah, we're already actually running into that yeah. issue right now because we've oh, done a few ads for companies and we're like, we see them and we're like looking at likes on Facebook or looking at shares, but we don't really have the deep analytics to verify them saying whether it produced well or not. Cause they could say easily say, Oh, it didn't do anything. So we're not going to pay you the amount we said we we're going to pay you Yeah. when realistically it was doing exceptionally well. So I think it's or definitely- when realistically you also, if you're say you're sponsored by MasterCard, um, you then MasterCard could post your video to their channel. And then you could see the same analytics that they see for that specific video. We've never had video specific analytics before. Like we've never been able to share the analytics of one video. We've had to share our whole profile. And like, obviously MasterCard isn't going to give you all of their analytics that they get from all their videos. It just wouldn't make sense. So being able to create on that like independent unit level, changing the unit of the internet, because the unit of the internet right now is all our profiles. And that's what people sell, which is why we get into all kinds of privacy and you know, personal identity. And that's why we're in this massive problem, this massive crisis that we're in. It's because the internet's built on profiles and it should It should be built on content. Yeah, if you're not paying for the service, you are the service. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 That's super cool though. I mean, yeah. cause that huge trend of having people be reliant on like their follower account or their profile status, quote unquote, rather than the original content that they're building. And then I always tell Christian the same thing, that if you look at Instagram and you see what's trending, and you see from the next guy who's trying to become trending, you slap the two together and they almost become a identical posts in a sense, just to yeah. match the algorithm, right? So yeah. it almost seems like which uh, stream bed to me as a, as a creator in a sense, um, it empowers the fact of building content first then trying to rely on the profile status then yeah. building well, that. that new- also gets around, so it still puts the content moderation. That's one part that we never want to be in. We don't want to be in content moderation. We don't. Like there's just people who have to sit through looking through the worst of the internet and it's right. just awful um, as to like deciding whether something lives or dies on a social media platform. And what we should be able to do is your profile gives you, um, gives you notoriety, but you should be able to, if you have, you know, if you have a YouTube profile that has a big following or has some sort of like, you know, some sort of clout. Uh, I mean, that's clout with a different company that didn't really make it, but, <laughs> um, but, um, so I remember getting yeah. all those invites left right. and right. Oh, join cloud, join cloud. Join cloud. Join cloud. cloud. And they couldn't figure out how to monetize it and it didn't make sense. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's a legitimate fear of most people. So yeah. I'm, I'm lying if I said that wasn't a legitimate fear. Yeah. I just want to build the- something cool yeah. that people want really. <laughs> like, yeah. Go the route that China's going right now. We can have uh, social scores that actually tell you whether or not you're allowed to do things. Yeah. Well, there is there's a reputation score on Streambed, but it doesn't tell you whether you're allowed to do something or not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that is your reputation on the internet. It does give you points for logging it, like linking in social media platforms and connecting your friends and whatever else. So there is a scoring mechanism, but it's not using you know uh, Chinese surveillance or yeah. or uh, facial recognition or any you no, know, not interested. Okay. It brings up a a good concept too in the fact that, um, you know, a lot of these times you're posting media and you could be posting, I mean, obviously we saw with the election, like fake news, fake articles, you know, putting photos of or videos of people that didn't actually was out of context. So, I mean, do you think StreamBed will actually help uh, combat some of those issues as well? So before, before the world blew up, um, I was actually supposed to do a TEDx talk specifically about how the blockchain or some combination of technologies, realistically, there's no, not going to be one killer tech that's going to, that's going to fight fake or that's going to solve fake news. But that doesn't mean the fight for, for real news and for, and for truth is something that's, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not worth fighting. Um, And uh, I was actually supposed to do a TEDx talk at Columbia University in, my, in May, May 5th. Um, obviously, that's not happening. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, specifically about using the blockchain to fight fake news. Um, and I think our tech in combination with a couple of very 
like specific ID techs you'd have to use, but, but the I, whole idea of correlating your profiles online to create a better score to determine whether someone is legit or not, that can only be determined by a really big organized effort. Like you could only fake it on like with StreamEd with a really, it would take a lot of work to, to, yeah. to fake it. And you'd have to have a lot of verified accounts that have agreed to be associated with you that, you know, have agreed to be associated with you that then were wrong. And like, it would, it would be a, a disaster. So we're trying to make it similar to like, you know, it's dumb to hack Bitcoin because it's really expensive. So like, we want to make it dumb to, to, or, or not dumb, but impossible to, to hack something like StreetBed or to, to create multiple profiles or whatever. We've gone through this whole, we've played out the game theories of it a lot um, as to like, what are all the bad things people could do on the internet? And at the end of the day, we're not going to solve all of them. We're not. Yeah. We, no, we try to do the right thing for the good people who want to do the right thing and make it so that those things actually matter. And then hopefully what we do can, can be better than, um, or can be bigger than, than the people trying to distribute false information. Now, are you guys going to be running on your own blockchain or are you going to be running on existing infrastructure, existing chains? So we actually run on, um, we're built on the open index protocol, um, which is a protocol that helps, um, helps blockchains or helps people publish to the flow blockchain. The Flow blockchain is originally a fork of Bitcoin. It's FLO. There's another one called FL FLOW, which was created like less than six months ago. And I got some beef with the Dapper Labs people about it. But um, FLO is um, a fork, originally a fork of Bitcoin. It's a, it's a chain, proof of work chain specifically designed for metadata. It was founded in 2012, 2012 2013 by Joseph Pacella, who happens to be our CTO as well. Um, right. Yeah, so we did, it all works out. Um, but what OIP is, is it's a public environment that stores metadata. It's lightweight, block sizes are small, um, or block sizes are large, um, transaction sizes are small, and um, we're able to publish that people created something at a specific point in time, and these are the terms for its reuse, or these are the terms, these are who's associated with it, or, or whatever. This could be, StreamBed is it's long game, again, is trying to make, solve part of the digital rights problem, at least tackle a chunk of it. Um, but as far as, um, you know, our, our tech is, is solid enough, but now it's getting, it's getting the story simple enough so that people are able to then actually activate it, uh, and that they're actually able to use it. So they'll have a wallet on the back end, And if you're a big nerd, you can go through and like download your, back up your own wallet to your own computer. If you wanted to, you could transact Bitcoin on the back end if you wanted to, but I mean, you probably are able to do that. I am definitely not. Um, and like most of our users also will not want to do that, but the opportunity is always there. A few tutorials and everyone will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the future is everyone just finding their way around a command line. Yeah. No, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean the, the company obviously sounds great for people like us, especially it sounds like a great thing. Um, and one of the main reasons of this podcast, though, is more to get in depth around the people. Uh, so let's walk it back a little bit. Tell us more about yourself. Like, how did you, where'd you grow up? Like, what are you, what are you involved outside of Streambed? Kind of what brought you to be this person you are today to lead this kind of amazing company? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I grew up in a small town that I just bought a house in six months ago, um, moved back to. Um, I grew up in Peterborough, Ontario. Um, I'm calling you from rural Canada. Um, and uh, I grew up in a, a, uh, my dad was a, uh, an engineer, or is, is an engineer, he's retired now, but my dad's an engineer. My mom's a uh, software programmer. She's actually on, the, on a team when the Toronto Stock Exchange was moving from uh, electronic trading to, or physical trading to electronic trading. She was a white hat hacker in like the 80s. Nice. So that was, that was, I grew up in a very math friendly household. Um, <laughs> and my brother is in the um, Canadian Forces. Um, he is. Um, in training uh, to become a combat engineer at Royal Military College. Um, so it's a very, no shortage of expectations in my family. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was always, I was always creative. I spent a bunch of time in musical theater. Um, I was always interested in finding, like I, I didn't take no for an answer very well. Um, and, and credentials didn't really always appeal to me. I have a business degree from a liberal arts university in Canada, here in Canada. Um, but I never thought I'd be in tech. I never thought I would end up in, 
in a, in software, much less leading a software company, like much less being anywhere near video creation or any of this. Um, but I studied business and finance um, uh, at this liberal arts university. But what they really taught us there is that at Trent is that they they really valued hard work and they valued um, approaches to solving problems. So they taught you how to solve a problem rather than what the problem is and what your answer should be. Um, and so that really got me into, okay, so if, if the concept of like, what is true is a binary concept, like it's, if, if the concept of what is true and what is not true, can something be true or not true? Or is there like a gray space in there? And then you get all kinds of, you know, challenges of misinformation and spin and communications and that kind of thing. So that's kind of how, and what steered me into PR and messaging was I need to fight for a better, a better system, or at least a better world where, where where truth matters and the fight for facts is actually worth it. Um, and that kind of, that problem solving aspect of it really got me or really drew me to, to the, the blockchain and, and kind of the tech aspect of it. So I ditched my last semester of school and I worked for, started working for Don Tapscott. My parents were not happy, but <laughs> I still graduated on time. So it's okay. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I think that I've always had kind of a deep conviction to to build systems that are better for everyone, um, and it was never a question as to to whether I would pursue this work or whether I would. There was always a question as to whether I would be an entrepreneur, but but I was always a self starter and was like, well, if nobody else is going to do it, then I'm going to do it. If nobody else is going to, I'm like, it can't be that difficult. Like I was um, reseeding my lawn today. This is very tough. I was reseeding my lawn today and. I was like, I've never really seeded my lawn before. I'm like talking to one of my friends who's helping me out. And um, like, I've never really done this before, but I mean, it can't be that difficult. You just, you just do it. Right. And like, I thought about it and I was like, that's probably like my general, like has been my mantra so far or has got me this far. I'm like, it can't, it can't be that hard. That can't be that hard. <laughs> so just try it out, I guess. That's pretty cool. So then yeah. with that whole idea of shifting from, I guess, going to an entrepreneurial mindset and finding what you like to do with, I mean, you've wanted to build companies and it says um, from some content that you put, showed to us for your media kit um, that you started a company at 18. So it seems like you've from a start at like a young age, you've already knew that you were geared to pursue something on your own and building something from your own merit. So like how has that process been? Like, has it been always what you imagined it to be? Is it completely a told? <laughs> okay, so then there's a good answer. <laughs> it never is. It never is what you think it's going to be, but I think that's the beauty of it. That's been how fun it is so far. My first um, company that I helped found was one called Trent Works. Um, it was a um, uh, graphics, marketing, branding kind of agency um, for mom and pop businesses in my um, Peterborough community. So I was pre always pretty good with computers. I grew up, you know, I started, I learned to type when I was like three. So it just was a thing that was learned in my house. Um, and uh, having that that sort of open mind and that access to both access to technology, but also I was never afraid of it. And like, I think that that part of it has taken me far because it's like, well, I mean, it can't be that hard. That means I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of messing up or or whatever I produce is good enough because one can never be judged on how they do something for the first time. Right, and so right. if you're constantly doing things for the first time, then you're in this really interesting space. And if you keep yourself in this perpetual headspace of like trying new things all day long, like um, I spent the day today or a big chunk of today. That's why I actually almost forgot about this. Um, I spent a big chunk of today um, uh, working through our privacy policy. And I now think that I like probably should be a privacy lawyer. This was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> Is it about uh, 90 pages in very small font so you can only see <laughs> Small font, yes, yes. Thank God my lawyers are like putting comments in, being like, this is what this means. And these are the decisions you need to make. And because we're privacy first platform, it was quite easy, but you still have to sift through all of it. I'm like, I mean, it can't, yeah. But I think the getting into that entrepreneurial mindset is like you, if you're okay being in that place where you're like, I just don't know what's going on. And that gets really, really stressful and kind of awful sometimes. But, but if you can, if you can force yourself to stay in that state, in that continuous state of unrest, then, 
then it, then you don't even, you don't blame yourself for doing something wrong. It doesn't mean that I don't do the things that I still like to do. I still take on consulting clients for PR and marketing and the partnership stuff that I used to do because it keeps the lights on, which is great. It makes it so I don't have to pay myself with my company's money, but it also, it also helps my confidence to like dig into this thing and say, how do I provide, or I know that I can provide value here. And so it's not super stimulating, but it helps keep that part of me that is really doubtful about whether I'm making a generally good contribution to the world. It takes that part of me that is always doubtful and is nagging at me being like, no, you should just go back to a desk job. You should just go back to something else. Keeping like even one or two clients over here to just like remind yourself that you are good at something and that you can make a you know measurable contribution to the world. That has been like the key, I think for me, it's like keeping on some form of other work. It could be nonprofits, could be fundraising. It could be helping people, you know, on your street rake leaves. Like sometimes I've been really frustrated with my job and I just go outside and rake leaves. Cause I know that like, that's something that I can complete. Right. It's something that you can sort of dig into that, you know, you can complete and that you will be able to complete it to a reasonable degree of effectiveness. Versus right. like completing something that you're like, I completed this, but I'm pretty sure it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a lot about just helping people though. And it seems like your driving force has been to make an influence on a certain type of community or influence from what you've been saying. And that's like the type of fulfillment that is that kind of where you get that sense of value rather than that external validation, but it's more for you to kind of feel like, hey, you know, I'm pursuing something that I'm passionate about rather than it just being based on like materialism or things yeah. like that. It took me a while to convince myself that stream bed was a job. It doesn't yeah. really feel like a job. It still doesn't. I even told someone today, they were like, they're like, Oh yeah, I'm looking, you know, he, he had just got, um, he had just got laid off from his job a couple of, couple of months ago, actually before, before the crisis. And, um, he, he was, I was like, oh, are you looking for a new job? And he's like, he's like probably mid career. So he's like, no, I'm not really looking. I don't, I don't really, you know, I'm figuring out what I, I want to do. I'm just taking some time for myself, whatever. And it's like, he's like, I'm not, it's not really a priority for me right now. And I was like, it's not really a priority for me either. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't really want a job. Like this whole not having a job thing is kind of great. <laughs> you see what we're doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or like, if I just get to chat with my friends on Zoom all day, this is great. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> somehow figure out a way to make money in between yeah, yeah. As long as, you know it's enough to keep the lights on but yeah so it's i think that part about helping people is like i was we were all put here to do more than like pay taxes and die like if i'm not here to it's not to help specific other people i'm i was never i'm I struggle with empathy. I struggle with like relating directly to people specific like one on one people I have you know um, someone made a joke that I only exist in curated environments. <laughs> um, usually I curate them myself. Um, and uh, I think being able to, to have that collective that you can then feel that you're striving towards the greater good or towards something, even if you're not doing it the same way. That's why I love the whole blockchain crypto ecosystem. It's like you agree that the boulder needs to get to the top of the hill but you don't, you might all be, you know, have a different, you might be seeing a different part of the boulder or you might be pushing it in a different way or trying to do something over here to make it easier for the boulder to get up. The hill. But you all agree collectively that the boulder needs to get to the top of the hill and you have that sort of fundamental underlay, underlying thing. And that's what we're trying to, we're, we're, we've grown really quickly at Streamit and we're trying to figure out this, this fundamental company culture stuff where it's like, what, what is our top of the hill? what is it what is the thing that we are really agreeing upon and at the end of the day we we came we want to create we want we want um people who contribute to content online to be able to feel that they have a stake in it we want everyone to understand what their stake is and how to to sort of leverage it or monetize it or or whatever they want we but the fundamental part of that is like how do i understand what my stake is and how do i how do I quantify it first? So quantifying audience is a big thing. And everyone has an audience. Like I have, everyone has influence and sort of just being able to, it's, it's not like a power to the people thing. It's not like give power, return power back to the people. No, no, no. We got to change the way that power is created in the first place. And we are voluntarily giving up our data every time we post something to YouTube. 
like that just happens. You you default to YouTube's restrictive um, restrictive rights rights contracts, and that's just the way that they've designed it. And yeah, do, and we need do to the audience to give you. Yeah. yeah, we and our audiences want to contribute. Our audiences want to to engage. They want to to connect, and people want to collaborate. So if we're able to facilitate that collaboration, then then we've done well. So we'll see. We're launching in three weeks, so we'll see. Right. So you have all this kind of like, a, like you said, you when you find yourself at a place or at like a stop, you you go out and rake leaves and all that. Um, outside of kind of business and entrepreneurship and tech. Uh, what else drives you? Like, what other things are you into? I know I've seen some uh, some medals from some other activities, and um, I am a sucker for pain and suffering. So um, I was a rower in university, um, so I'm still really involved with my local rowing club. Um, they the our big regatta of the year was supposed to turn 50 this year, um, and it is still going to turn 50 whether we're inside or not. But um, <laughs> I'm I'm the chair of the foundation for that um, to help raise money for kids to row and sort of have the same experience that I had. Um, And, um, you know, so that we can buy boats and more beer and all the rest of it. Um, And uh, so I do that. Um, And then uh, in my spare time, because I can't, because rowing is a very all in thing. Um, So in the springtime, I coach rowing to high school students. So I spent three seasons coaching at Upper Canada College, which is um, Canada's most prestigious all boys school. Um, And it's like a private school in Toronto. Um, and that was amazing. Um, and now I'm back in Peterborough, so I'll coach here in the spring, but that's a super high school season. It's very short. Um, the rest of the time, cause you have to be all in for rowing or not. Um, I am a triathlete. So, um, I've run six Olympic triathlons. Um, and I ran my first Ironman last year, a half, a half Ironman, but it was a, I mean, that's not really downplaying it. There's, it was still seven and a half hours. A half Ironman is still pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's, one one point two mile swim, fifty six mile bike, and then a half marathon. So, so did you, no. for the Olympic triathlons, was it Olympic tri- uh, trials? Oh, no, 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 um, Olympic okay. length triathlons. So those are I only know it in kilometers. Um, it's a one one uh, twelve hundred twelve hundred meter swim, which is like oh, so three quarters of a mile. Yeah, three quarters of a mile. Um, and then a fifty k bike. No, 40k bike. I forget. 40k oh, wow. bike and a 10k run. Wow. So this is not. It's not that long. It's like two and a half hours. That's not that long. <laughs> not that long. I mean, like you would ex- you would be at the gym for that long. Yeah. I mean, I did track before, and that was like a 10 second burst of <laughs> oh, energy that I had to exert. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. so how would- I I can't do any of these short burst things because I have really deep commitment issues. <laughs> 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 uh, I can't deal with anything with the long stuff. It's no it's way no. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it like pacing yourself that? I mean, your first one you ever did, was it like you got halfway through and you're burnt or did, were you pretty good about the pacing? Uh, so I just don't really think about it at all. <laughs> um, I know what my normal pacing is based on what my, like, based on what my, my um, Strava tells me how quickly I'm going while I'm going. So I'll look at stats afterwards, but I don't spend a lot of time looking at my analytics or whatever. It's like, while I'm running, I know what kilometer, I don't even usually know what kilometer I'm on. Sometimes I do, but it's, that's like blank mind time because my, my, after like kilometer 12 or so, your mind just can't really think in straight lines anymore, which is like primo relaxation mode. It's the best because you can't think about anything because you're so tired. (laughs) <laughs> which is it's awesome because like I don't I keep myself up I, my sleeping patterns are messed up all the time I sleep like I'll sleep like five or six hours a night usually like it's not very yeah yeah oh, I have man. I have no dependents but I literally feel like I'm a parent like <laughs> doesn't sleep at all just because I, I just don't I don't know why I can never get to sleep that's yeah it's something I'm trying to work on but such is life but yeah, that's the yeah, exercise is the only time of like Zen, just like some sort of baseline where I'm not thinking about anything and I'm just like blissfully looking at trees and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. I, we can kind of relate to that, like yeah. jujitsu and stuff. Like yeah, that. well, and the other part of jujitsu is like that's the best part about being in the pool when you're training at, or when you're on your bike is I can't email anyone back when I'm in the pool. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's definitely the reason why we both train too, is because it's like, like you said, it's that moment where 
the only thing you can focus focus on is that moment because if you don't focus on that moment, I mean, for us, we'll get choked out. <laughs> yeah, trip on a rock and face plant or drown in the water. Or, or it's because you, on your bike you're going pretty fast, so like you could go down a hill and hit one tiny rock and then you die. Like, <laughs> you got any good uh, horror stories from any of them? Uh, I've had a couple of good crashes. They had just installed some new bike lanes in my neighborhood when I was living in Toronto. And um, they put in a curb. Curbs are usually like this tall. And they put in a curb that was like twice as tall, which is super dumb. But I was just like biking along. I was in my, I was actually going pretty fast because it's pretty flat. I was probably going like, I don't know, kilometers. I was probably going like 35 kilometers an hour. Um, and, uh, and then the bike lane had like a tiny little, it's, it's built for people who are going at like a normal speed on a bike. So the arrows on the ground telling you that you had to turn, that the bike lane ended. And there was a pole there. Um, I was I was kind of looking, but not really. And you couldn't really tell. So um, you are supposed to turn. And uh, I ran directly into the curb and like over my handlebars, cracked my helmet, like scratched my whole body. It was awful. So there's been a couple of those. Um, but you know, just get a new helmet. <laughs> Live your life. Limp home. <laughs> I, I feel your pain there. When I was a kid, I was on a, a bike path and. You know, being that little badass uh, 12 year old going as fast as I could down the bike path, my handlebars went forward on, yep. and came on untied. And then I went right over, knocked my teeth back. Luckily, my braces saved my teeth. Oh, nice one. All my I could think of on the way home. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All I could think of on the way home, though, was are we going to get pizza still? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was like, I didn't, I didn't never did any like super reckless uh, sports. I've always been an endurancey person. My brother, I played hockey for a little while. Everyone in Canada played hockey. Um, but uh, <laughs> like a right yeah, 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 I played soccer for a bit, some like running, cross country running and stuff. I was always in something. Um, but yeah, it was never the, the short bursty sports. I'm like, meh. like, why would I gear up for so long to only do something for like 10 seconds? that's true yeah. i mean it's true <laughs> no, it's not worth it for all the gear that yeah. i have to bring yeah that is true a, bur a burst is kind of a a loose term though because like we only <laughs> actually in a fight it's i mean most fights are like five minutes where most people are like oh five minutes that's not that bad uh, five minutes it's five minutes like it's like you said it's only two hours well that's two brutal <laughs> hours <laughs> yeah true, yeah. true. By, the, by the end of the the bike after in the in my Ironman and the end of, by the end of the bike, it was probably like five hours in, just over five, five and a half hours in. And I was like, yeah, I could die. I could just stop right now. That, that'd be enough. I don't need this half marathon. I could be done. That What's the be. feeling though at the end when you hit that finish line? I want to throw up. Relation or? You're up. Yes. No, the whole thing is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're like, you kind of, you kind of, I just wanted to sleep really. You're like mm. kind of elated and you're happy that you finished it, but it's more just like, oh, thank God we're here. <laughs> we're done now. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Just doing it for the gram, you know? <laughs> for the picture before and after. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. And I didn't drown and I didn't crash. So those, those were the, those were the goals. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's definitely impressive. Uh, I Like, I could roll jujitsu for 10 hours straight and be fine. But if yeah, you had me yeah. run around the block, I'd get about three houses down and be like, are we done yet? Like, <laughs> is this <laughs> not enough? I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, the key, key with running is there's a couple of different, I realized that, at least for me, there's a couple of different thresholds where you're like, okay, I have to get, by like two kilometers, I'm going to want to stop. Like, yeah. I'm going to want, I'm just going to be like super wheezy. And like, there were a couple of times where I was so, so before this, before this Ironman, I had traveled, I was fundraising for Streambed and we did like, we were way too early. We had no tech yet. Like we were trying to, you know, raise on vaporware like everyone else in the blockchain space. Cause I've seen, I had seen a lot of my friends be successful doing that. So we gave the old college try, Michael, Casey and I, and um, we traveled to, I was in like on three different, three, four different time zones, three, no, sorry, three different time zones in like five different cities in two weeks. And then a week later, I ran this Ironman and like, it was horrible because I hadn't gotten that much sleep or you're sleeping on airplanes. And like, I'm, I'm a big red eye fan because I can usually sleep anywhere, but you, you just don't, I don't know. I, it was just not a good scene. So I almost didn't do it. So it was, it was just the, yes, I did get to the finish line. Yes, I did show up. That is my success. And just like setting those like measurable 
measurable goals that are really, really low where you're like, I succeeded at this. That's enough. And then whatever happens next, like gravy, great. <laughs> set, set really low goals. <laughs> Uh, that's why we created this podcast. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you're like, no. and, and well, even then, we have our first deployment of Streambeds Tech in three weeks. Um, we're launching um, with a portion of the tech track at um, Consensus Distributed. Um, so CoinDesk has signed on as Streambeds' first customer, and we're really happy about that. Um, and uh, even then, so I gave a presentation to my to my team on Friday because I realized that they were getting really stressed out about the timeline and when things were going to be delivered and like, were we going to deliver on time and all this functionality and the press push with it and all the other things that have to stack up in order for us up for a launch to go well. And as part of part of the thing, I was like the, one of the, the headlines on my slide was like, some bad things are going to happen. And like, or, and it was basically like, I will be happy if no one signs up, even if no one uses it, even if, people just receive an email and nobody clicks us and everyone ignores us. Like, I will be so happy if we can just do that because like the marketing and like push part of it is something that I know that our team is good at. And the, the last hurdle for us, the we've, we've beat the technical hurdle. We can do it. We've, and now we just have to beat the, the sort of execution hurdle and the marketing hurdle is easy after that, or at least it is for, or at least we feel it is for us because it's something that we think people need and we think that we have the right, fundamentals especially because of like privacy and collaboration and people all people have to do right now is stay at home and test software and watch stuff online yeah. so it's yeah. a good time to be in video collaboration yeah because that's what's kind of what i was thinking too when you're mentioning the whole yeah. process of how it works is that we've been talking about it and we think that this time now is even more empowering to creators because of the whole i mean not to wish poor i guess status on other companies and hollywood and so yeah. forth but um, the independent creator seems like they're beginning to get more power as this whole situation situation kind of unfolds because major corporations are having a harder time to deal with clients or other developing content because for one, they don't, they can't maintain a large production crew. Whereas people like us can do something like this where mm -hmm. it's two people, but we're still creating great content. You know what yeah. I mean? We're having a great conversation and building that kind of thing. Two so, people, a camera and an internet connection are good to go. Yeah, right. right, exactly. But I think a big part of that is that anyone, anyone can create. But the other side, the flip side of that is that I think the not necessarily, we will always have celebrities. We'll always have famous people or people whose opinions we value. Um, yeah. But I think people's spheres of influence are getting increasingly more localized. So for, for the last like three years or so, I'm an avid reader of the Edelman Trust Barometer every year when it comes out. This, that is um, what, what Edelman thinks People are uh, people are trusting on the internet. The level of trust that human humans put into Google, into social media, into news sites, into you know traffic. Who's reading? Who's sharing? What are they doing with it? Um, it's a highly highly researched piece of work. And for the last three years, there's been an increasing return to localized trust. So what happens in times of crisis is that people revert back to their own to their sort of not really the primal tendencies or something, but they revert back to their own local communities of, of places that they trust when they're in a time of uncertainty and confusion. So this return to localized trust means that we need to find new incentive systems that are not, so, so we've had a crisis of legitimacy on the internet. And so if we have a barrage of information, that's a crisis. We have too much information to sift through. And, and so what do we do? If I need to buy a hammer for my new house, I'm gonna call my dad and, or I'm gonna call like my friend who's a carpenter. And my friend who's a carpenter is not really an expert on hammer purchases and probably hasn't read all the reviews and like probably hasn't, but, but I'm gonna follow his advice because it's the easiest and I trust his opinion and it's going to be good enough. And I think the the humanity has got so focused on like being the best and like everyone's being forced to be the best. And you're like, well, you don't, most of the time we've created this completely unattainable standard. This is back to setting low goals. Um, we've created this unattainable standard, but if we, if we can just like say, okay, well, what if we're creating products for all of these people, this whole ocean of people have influence. They matter to the people in their own ecosystems. And yeah, they might create these like little self reinforcing bubbles that create all kinds of problems, but if we can find an accurate way to measure that, then these niche communities can be rewarded for all kinds of stuff. 
Like, if you yeah. guys could just reward people who care about jujitsu, like the there are probably products that people who do jujitsu like that that only people who do jujitsu buy. <laughs> asahi, asahi bowls. <laughs> oh, <okay. Yeah. laughs> no, no, no. That's just people in California. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, you bring up a good point though i mean that's kind of the reason why we named the podcast levels too is because yeah. you know like you said it, it's not you don't always have to appeal to the person at the very top it's oh. all these levels along the way that there's valuable people and sometimes those lower levels have more people in them that really yeah. need the, the help more and really need the contribution more well, and they and they value the connection more so like if i ask my friend my who is a carpenter about what kind of hammer to buy he, we now have a strengthened relationship because he knows that I trust what he has to say. And so he's going to be more thoughtful about the things that he says because he knows that I am valuing the things that he's doing and I'm acting on them or I'm actioning on them somehow. So that's, I mean, eventually part of Streambed's revenue model is to help basically measure that so that my friend who advises all of his other friends on what kind of hammers to buy can be like sponsored by a hammer company to then be paid to allow people to click through to buy the correct hammer. So it gets, that's where the AdWords piece kind of comes in. But, um, but yeah, it's that return to localized trust that we're seeing more and more. If there's a crisis, what do you do? We're all, you know, we all have to stay home. Okay. So we all have to, you know, get reacquainted with our families. We have to figure out how to bake and how to like, you know, grow up. There's so many people growing vegetable gardens right now. It's exhausting. Baking bread too. Oh, so much bread. Have you been able to buy flour? I can't buy flour yeah. in any store. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't make cookies. The other day we went to go make uh, s'mores and they were out of marshmallows. That's so bogus. When has there ever been yeah. a shortage of marshmallows? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, graham crackers. Yeah, graham crackers. Yeah. But it's just like the, the global supply chains are not prepared for this like return to our, like, it's like we've gone back to 1960, except we all have Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> which I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. No, uh, no. One thing too to touch upon is that um, like how you brought up a, you know, a great point about how these kind of relationships and people revert to kind of local trust. And then one thing I had said earlier, like you definitely have this very um, unique ability to bring people together and also meet and influence new people. Um, but in a society right now that's really heavily against almost communication in a way, like to get a phone call now, people are almost offended. They'd rather you text them. Like, how do you approach making new connections? You can call me, call me anytime. <laughs> how do you, how do you approach like making new connections and like getting to know new people and bring, you know, finding the right people to kind of keys to keeping your circles? Well, so I think. I've had a lot of success with like smallish group gatherings. So I'm in a couple of different um, webinar groups. So there's, there's like, um, or, or different groups that would be in person, but then are online. Um, I've had a lot of like, there's, there's a lot of connect. Like, I think if you can give up, if you give up an hour of your time, you might not want to give up a half hour of your time to talk to somebody new where you don't know what the call to action is. So taking the pressure off that, and that's kind of how, how I've been successful in, and, and how our, our former, our former boss, Matt was successful as well. And is successful is in his sort of connective ability is bringing interesting people together and having your network trust you enough to curate those interesting people that they will come. Mm -hmm. And so, so being able to do that is like, I had, um, it was my birthday two weeks ago and I had a zoom. Like, Thank you. I had like a zoom. It's okay. It's I'm turning 26. It's like the beginning of boring birthdays. So it's, it's okay. <laughs> now, yeah, th there's no, nothing interesting here on out till like I turn 30. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. No, I feel like 20, make it there. A good milestone years. I don't know. For me, 27 was like a big shift for me. Oh. I feel like I became an adult a little bit. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, that's stupid. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's a no. <laughs> Pass. I, I will opt out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, no. Swipe. Swipe left. Yeah. Just that off. <laughs> Not doing it. No. <laughs> uh, but I think that's what we're talking about. Oh, curating groups. So. Curating groups. Uh, <laughs> I was like, we're gonna record, we'll record the reward or rewind the video. <laughs> um, but if. If, uh, so if you can curate these groups of people where you give each person like, but, but you serve, I serve kind of like a key. I like playing the like moderator role. So I'll get like 
eight people who don't know each other um, on the phone. And then there has to be a moderator in between who just like gets people talking and gets people interested enough that then they will take a phone call from any of those people if they need something or if they, but it's, it's I think creating for yourself, not necessarily a Rolodex of, of really good connections, but just, just being really clear about the things that you need with the people that you talk to and then only reaching out to people, not necessarily only when you need something, but reaching out to people equally with, with here's an opportunity for you, and then here's, or here's two opportunities for you, and then here's one thing for me. It's like two for Caesar, one for me. Um, <laughs> like you, you, wanna, you wanna give as much as you can. And like, I will always connect people to other interesting people just because it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. and, and making, or, or if you're on the phone with someone, most of the time, even if I can't help them, like most of the time I either won't, won't have what they need right away or won't need what they are selling right away. But I usually know someone who will and being able to, to take what they are telling me, translate that to my other friend or other person that I know, um, and, and explain it to them and then be able to facilitate that connection instead. So like, even if I can't help, cause I can't be everything to everyone, no one can be everything to everyone, but if you are able to facilitate those connections together, then like in, in a lot of cases, those two people have become better friends than the two of us ever were, which is fine. Great. Like go off and play little babies. <laughs> like, great. That's awesome. Now we have that connection together. And I know that because of that, because that bond is really strong, that these two people now will always show up for me. So it's, it's creating groups of people who are interesting, who you know will show up because they know other interesting people will be there. And that will only come from connections that you make just because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Cause yeah. it's weird with the creator community. And it's funny that you are building a platform for the creator community where it's hard because people don't want to be stealing each other's stuff or they want to, but people don't want to give up their secrets that are there. Mm -hmm quote their niche right but the more you see the bigger youtubers the bigger creators they're collabing more and more and more and their platform excels because of it yeah. and we're because they um, have a collective audience of both well yeah, and that right. drives down costs too right so i have i have a friend who's podcast who was he was actually on a podcast i was listening to just before this um he he's a, a videographer he lives in london ontario and he he wanted he had a contract with uh, a company to do to do some sort of either a commercial or something like that so what he did is he knew he's like well what do I do I can't go out and shoot I can't hire art I can't hire um, talent I can't be in a busy public location so he sent a message around to a bunch of his friends who are also filmmakers and you know one of them's at home with his dog and the other one's you know at home with his wife and one has a bunch of kids and one lives on a farm and like so they're shooting all of this content and then they're sending it to him and then he created it into something that his client needed. And I don't know what the relationship was between all of these people, but at the end of the day, it probably doesn't really matter um, because they, he either pays them for that or he can, if he could just loop them in to how that video did in the future, then that creator then has something to tap, to hang their hat on for the future thing or whatever. it's all, it's all like give and take. And if you give more than you take, then the take will always work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like a good karma aspect too, because we believe the same thing that if you give a lot and to the right people that you get more in return eventually in terms of over time. But it's crazy because the value of what we perceive ourselves as creators was a total shift. And it's kind of interesting because when I first met Christian, he would always argue saying, you know, your work is worth more. And I never thought so because the value of, of yeah, what companies perceive it's hard when yeah. you to like pricing work, like even pricing something right. like the kind of work that I do, where it's like a project will come to me and be like, okay, well, can you help us get the exposure that we want? I'm like, well, it doesn't really work like that. I would probably do that anyway. Like right. probably just do that because it's the right thing to do. But how do I then, how do you then turn around and price that? And yeah, it's always going to be priced lower, but then it's a question, do you want to do business with your friends or right. do you want to do business for a lot of money with people you don't like? Right. But it's cool that your platform solves that problem to a huge degree to where it actually even places the power into us being able to see the analytics for one yeah. and then be able to have uh, metrics and quantifiable like variables for us to be able to tell clients and going up to potential companies and saying, this is what we provide. It's on hard paper, hard numbers. Yeah. This is what we can charge. But I mean, that's a huge thing because for one, um, I mean, 
I, Chris, Christian gets mad because I basically give stuff out for free, which is true because yeah, I've always yeah. equated myself to being like, that's what I should be doing at the current point of my career. But and yeah. there's a big difference. So there's a difference between giving with the, yeah. not, so, not so much saying giving with the idea that you'll get something later, but giving with the idea that you're creating a relationship and then there's just underpricing yourself. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah underpricing is, is, it's, you have, well, but then you have to be, if you're willing to, you have to be willing to walk away from the jobs that won't pay you that. Or, or you trade, you, it's a trade-off. Right. It's always yeah. a trade-off. Is, but, right. but I think, I think, and it's something I've actually like kind of channeled into my personal life. I think, Christian, I think I've told you about this. My idea of um, um, measurable hours and like just generally my philosophy on money in general. Um, so I take how much money I make in a year and I don't split it by the amount of hours that I work. I split it by the amount of waking hours that I have. And so I don't really sleep that much. So there's a lot more waking hours. So it's actually lower, but, yeah. um, but I take the amount of waking hours. And if I'm deciding to do something versus deciding to do something else that will take more time, but will cost less, then it has to be a higher margin than the time that I would get back by doing that thing. Because what people do when they have money is they always take the time back first, always. They will, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you have, I mean, people have different spending habits, but they, you know, will um, go to a hairdresser instead of cutting their hair at home. They will. It's a bad example. I desperately need a haircut right now. <laughs> <laughs> my hair is. Uh, I cut my own. Like... That's why we can't turn around. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wear a hat, but never mind. Oh no, man, I think it's like horrible. Like twelve-year-old skater boy flippy thing going on. <laughs> It's like on my neck. I'm not, not about <laughs> I've it. actually shared that philosophy with Matt. And I, I mean, uh, to a probably yeah. less articulate uh, explanation <laughs> on my end, but uh, <laughs> the same idea that like your, your value, it doesn't matter if you were like those hours were free or not. The ma matter yeah. of the fact is that those hours are your hours. Yeah. So if you're going to give yeah. them to somebody else, you need to yeah. be getting something in return. So that's where you get the, the buy or build idea. Like, do you buy it or do you build it? Well, if you buy it, it's going to cost you this much, but if you build, it's going to cost you this much. Does that equate but to the amount of hours? You're going to get it over a certain amount of time. If you build it, yeah. we've, we've, you know, talked, we've, we've thought about a lot of different companies that we wanted to work with to either white label a wallet or white label or whatever. Like uh, my, my, my gut, my gut says, you know, partner with as many companies as you can get in as many service providers. Cause then you provide a more full solution. But at the same time, I'm going to just said solution. I hate that word. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, you provide a more full product that actually means something to somebody or can be, or can do be all things to all people, but you have to decide long down the road, what is that licensing fee or whatever that fee is to use that thing? What's that going to be in, or if you're building your tech on something that, that may or may not be there, what happens if that leg just isn't there anymore? Like that's, that's an infrastructure thing. But I think as far as like measurable hours goes, if my hours are worth a hundred dollars, it's like, okay, it would cost, you know, I could, I could drive there, but it'll take me six hours or I could fly there and that'll take me an hour or less like that. Um, and you know, if I'm on the road for six hours, that's six hours that I don't get to sit in front of my computer or spend time with my family or spend time raking my leaves or whatever, like that's six hours that I don't get. And if, if driving is really Zen for you, then that's not six lost hours. That's six hours that you can spend on the phone or do whatever. But it's just, it's all trade-offs as to, and then it's, I go the same way as approach as, as usually pricing my work. It usually ends up being, I take what my yearly salary would be and then multiply it by the amount of hours that's going to take me to work for this company. That's usually what my rates are. Yeah, no, for sure. But I mean, that's cool because I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be able to meet both of you for a sense. When Christian told me uh, all those, uh, the breakdown of essentially earning profit because I was not earning profit <laughs> when I was creating. Um, it, it's nice to know that like that was a big stepping stone for also me to be able to see the worth of what I'm being able to create. But if I never had that connection with him, I would never have seen that. But the ability of a stream bed kind of gives back to creators is that if you were in a position like me, you're able to hard to find at what you were worth based on what you're able to see with yeah. in the in a, analytics. So for me, when you can give the company the ability to play a role there, they're not just paying yeah. for something. They can like see their analytics in real time. They can have an account that then they can log into. They can see all the creative stuff that they've been looking at. And so that like from an enterprise standpoint, that's what we're like one of our sort of end game revenue sources is, is provide being able to provide a more detailed look at analytics for companies that are aggregate that has nothing to do with exploiting privacy or selling personal information 
right. it's just my privacy policy says I will never sell information. I'm not selling information. I'm not because right. yeah. it's your um, showing people the relationship between their content and someone else's content of which there will always be a consensual relationship and there right. has to be otherwise it's not worth anything yeah exactly because that's a huge thing because i mean we i we used shoot suite before and we get these analytics and then we show companies and then when we like, see it as like yeah they're like why does this matter to me yeah. if it doesn't show up <laughs> then it doesn't really affect me and I shouldn't pay that much. So, but the relationship between the go back and forth, that's huge. I mean, it allows them to play a contributory role. So they're like, they want their, their, you know, if you create a piece of content and they want the content to be successful, then they should share it too. You created right. it, but then they, and then you can both share in, in the traffic that comes out of that and everyone can work together. We are better when we work together. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> I, I, I think that's <laughs> awesome. Because it's like, yeah, <laughs> I can I can speak in rose colored glasses all day long. But I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I'll, co I'll connect you to our, our onboarding team, and you can you try it out. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna prep Matt before this and kind of let him know a little bit more about the company, but I figured it'd be better to kind of have the discovery because it was the same for me when I first heard about the company. And I should actually say, just for a disclaimer, you're not sponsoring this video. You're no, not, I'm not sponsoring. No this way, video. monetarily. You don't. Have don't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have but, money. Uh, no, we have we don't have money to sponsor this video. Also, exactly. I just generally think ads are not a good a good. Yeah, 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 same yeah. yeah. But yeah, the reason why I say that is like obviously we're, we're pumping this thing, but it was <laughs> kind of funny because in hearing about it at first, I was like, oh, that's cool, whatever, and like didn't really know the full gist. Then I actually went through your information, and you told me a little bit more about it, and I was like, this is exactly what creators need. Like they need a way to profit without having uh, being able to be kneecapped. I mean, something as simple yeah. as like Amazon. A lot of these creators, they relied on Amazon for their affiliate links to yeah. make money. Yeah. Well, Amazon just all of a sudden was like, oh, yeah, that number we told you, the percentage. Yeah, we're going to cut that probably yeah, down yeah. maybe by half or more. And then yeah. same thing with YouTube. You know, YouTube, the numbers go up for viewership. All of a sudden, the percentages go down. People are like, wait a minute. Like, yeah. I was yeah. banking on that for money. What are we going to do now? Yeah. And, so, well, and the biggest creators on YouTube are making a big stink about this. If you look at, you know, you look at the highest paid blogger, I think last year was PewDiePie, and he made one point something million dollars a year, which realistically, in the grand scheme of things, is not a lot of money. But you right. look at that, the biggest statistic that shocked me was like, look at the amount of money that PewDiePie was paid, and then the amount of revenue that YouTube made on advertising. Oh, yeah. On PewDiePie's videos specifically. If you just look at that cross section, the percentage is so small. It's like yeah. mine, it's like less than 0.5 of a percent. It's like so, so small of the amount of revenue that he, we create all of the, but that's the thing is we've always thought it was about money. And if it's about money and someone has to pay for it, then they're probably going to steal it. And so I did a series of blog posts called Please Steal My Videos. And um, the whole, the whole thing was basically incentivizing, okay, yeah, we can get contributors, but then you could take it one step further and say, what if I could engage my audience to share my video? And then I could get all of their analytics too. And then they could be a part of this kind of downstream creative value chain, or they could turn it into a meme or a clip or a compilation or all this, other, all the other cool parts of the internet. Like I saw a, uh, Marvel animation of like all of the Marvel characters animated that had nothing to do with Marvel. It was just someone who animated, who loves Marvel, who made this really cool thing. And they just did it for no reason. And, and I think that the problem that we had is that we thought that money was the currency of the internet, but it's not, it's data. And if data is the currency of the internet, then how can we correlate all those data pieces together so that everyone gets their fair share of data. And if everyone gets their fair share of data, then the money won't follow. Because yeah, people are always willing to pay for something that they can see. Well, yeah. by opening up the data, you're also putting the money back in the pockets of the creators and, uh, you know, the people actually it's contributing to our data. being shorted. Yeah. But it's also like, I think it's the original counterpart to where because creators are making so little now based on the AdSense revenue and things like that, that in order to catch the trends, even get to their level, you have to follow a certain trend, which is whatever you see trending on YouTube. Either it's be like following the big guys like PewDiePie or Peter McKinnon or you know, whatever video they're making at the time. So instead of it being people creating original content, which is what really people want to see in the first place, it's just a giant copycat scheme, you know, and that's kind of like what I was trying to talk about before where it's like, if you empower the creator backwards in terms of giving them the ability to even make money off of it, they won't care what the algorithm is. They just want to make whatever they want to make. But that's what the core part is of what you're doing is that you're changing 
the industry back to where it was when YouTube first was created, in my opinion, to where like people just wanted to create because it's a cool platform without the, the incentive to create ad, re ad revenue. Yeah. So for people like us, where we're trying to be the balance between following the hype and trying to get clout and then making your own original con content, it's almost like we have to lean towards the other way in order just to become relevant first. Yeah, yeah you have to drop your passion and follow the algorithm to make the money. Yeah. yeah. Which, well, it's which, like we're talking about which, you know, we're, we're so we're um, uh, on Friday, we're doing our, um, what we think is uh, the final session or, or our final sort of formal session of the Creative Destruction Lab, which is the incubator that, um, that has, I can really credit for like Creative Destruction Labs comp, like program for, so this one specifically for blockchain companies but they have an AI stream and a, they have the, the world's only space company incubator. I don't even, like, I think I'm an intelligent person. But then I listen to these people who build like space startups and I'm like, I'm a dum dum. <laughs> like, like this, this is, yeah, okay. And then they have a quantum computing one. And then like, if I thought I was dumb listening to the space people, like, oh my God. I read the books and when I'm done, I'm like, <laughs> I heard a lot of words and I'm not sure what all of them meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm like, I'm just trying to create something that'll help people make cool videos. <laughs> like, that's all I want to do. One huge, and, part that, one huge part that you brought up, though, that was really interesting, which I think is really a game changer that doesn't exist right now, is that distinction you made, which is very good about the not only the creators, but the contributors. Right now, there is no way for contributors. Like, you're on this podcast right now, and the only way for you to make money is if we were to pay you to be on the podcast. Yeah. But and that, that, that rate would have to be set in advance and I could never ask for more money. I could never exactly. ask you to take my image down. I could like any sort of image management online. There is none. Yeah. But if you're contributing to this podcast, like you said, you should have a, a way to like, if you say, you know, some prolific things within this podcast are extremely valuable to people. Well, you know, we'll, we'll people will probably go through this and pull some quotes or something. Yeah. We'll be monetizing those, but you'll make nothing from it. But if you did yeah. it the other way around, like with your system, it's really cool because it empowers people to contribute more. So it's like, okay, maybe you're not a, a creator per se, but now you're like, well, I want to be on people's podcasts. Cause if I'm on a podcast, it's a way for me to also make money. And then I think it's going to really make the, <laughs> we just yeah, yeah. like that's crazy. It's really going to grow this yeah. system because oh, you're man. literally fostering communication. You're saying let's, all be part yeah. of this well and let's link in all of your profiles too so it's like you have we are we're launching with youtube twitter and we're hoping snapchat um because those are you know it's the api thing but yep. um and we're in line for apis of all the other ones um but that's a whole oh my god this is, you think i think this is a bureaucracy like that's a bureaucracy oh, yeah, yeah. like who gets access to the api keys is dumb um so sorry zoom i think i shouldn't have said that it's like it's, it's like oligarchy yeah no i agree with that yeah. that, i mean yeah, that's yeah. so cool I mean, that's well that, and they but, limit but that idea yeah. is that it, it allows me to lend not only my words that i'm speaking right now but it allows me to lend my my profile so right. so what, how we're actually launching is we're collecting up um organizations that used to throw conferences that are now trying to figure out some virtual way of working online. So consensus is our first one. And then we're launching with the Asia blockchain summit in the summer. And then there's a couple more along the way, but we're also collecting up everyone and their dog, including hopefully you guys um, who um, yeah, is creating a webinar series or a podcast or like a cool video thing that they're collaborating with people. My dream is to get like John Krasinski and his some good news network. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh those videos are so yeah. good. And he yeah. just brings in all of these rich people who are doing things for no reason. So that's yeah, that, like, other that's than the fact that like it's a cool place. So like that's any sort of collaborative thing on the internet that's a series. I'm like, give me all of them because companies, brands are all trying to find a way to participate or layer themselves in, or they just want to be on the same level. We came, we, advertising on the internet is so broken because it puts a oh, corporation yeah. here and the company, company here. And then we all just get like, like beat up by corporations, yeah. which sucks because we hate that. And yeah. like the corporations don't like it too. Like people think that the next like two or three years will still be powered by ads. But after that, it's going to be something else. So yeah. we have it's to gonna, figure out what that something else is. It's going to be a crazy paradigm shift, especially when it comes to like original content. Like we already have some uh, original shows in the works. Cool. And oh yeah, you be, definitely talk to my content team. They love yeah. the original shows. It's gonna be amazing though to see the fact that not only can we put out an original show, and yeah, well we can like pay the actors and pay the people that are gonna be a part of it, but 
then they can still make money off of the yeah, show yeah. itself. So and I mean, then you as can a distribute person, the show for free. Like yeah. you can, you can put, you could sell it to Netflix or you could sell it to these like walled garden video platforms, or you could just distribute it on YouTube, but there's been no way to quantify that yeah. the other way. So you have to have all the connections to get into YouTube, to get into to YouTube originals, to get into um, all these other walled gardens of, of people that distribute curated content. Well, in the barrier to entry too, beyond just being able to make wow. the connections and know the people and the equipment they require you to have too. I mean, yeah. it's like what? For the, oh, for the cameras for Netflix. I mean, the cheapest one I think was like grand. 10 grand, but that's like no lenses, no nothing, no other stuff you need. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Good to yeah. know that because we make are planning to make things for them. So yeah, let us know when you're doing that. We'll, we'll tell you all the cameras you need and all the equipment you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll just borrow yours. Or we could just shoot it for you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> here, perfect. That was my plan all along. All right, let Sweet. us know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's crazy because the fact that it makes it where companies have an incentive to even reach out to creators too. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, I, I'm just mind blown right now. It's so cool. Well, it, it incentivizes because right now, like, we've worked with, you know, um, I'm going to put it in quotes, influencers, <laughs> uh, because just having a high number of followers on Instagram All qualifies. Of the games. They're probably just powered by Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so being, being, you know, having a certain amount of followers uh, qualifies you as somebody of influence when realistically there's no quantified numbers to show that it's real. Because well, yeah. it, it's the other part is it's engagement. So, so what we're trying, we're trying to reward engagement. I'm not, I just keep bringing it back to our company. I'm not trying just, I'm literally not. No, 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 it's good. It's good. I think. But we, like, we've got some background. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but the, the point is that we've, we've built all of these structures on the internet based on attention. And we think attention, like even, even blockchain has got it a little bit wrong. Like they talk about basic attention token. Like the attention yeah. was never the currency. I can pay a bot to watch ads all day. Like, oh, yeah. I can do that easily. And it will do that. And it will count it as a view every single time. And then my videos will have 10,000 views. And you can buy all that stuff. Money can't buy engagement though. Money can't buy people caring about your stuff. You can't yeah. pay people to give a shit about stuff. You can't pay for, you know, I have this many followers, but 2000 of them accurately respond to me. Or yeah. you have, um, you know, I can say I have, you know, I have 13,000 people in my CRM, in my like contact database. That sounds like a lot, but how many of them can I actually activate to do cool things? That yeah. curation and engagement is the crucial part about this. And how do I make how do I how do I make the best use or sorry make an impact with the the sort of the the followers that I have to to make it so that they actually will act on the things that I've done. So like there's so much evidence that click through rate is not a good metric at all. Oh, all no, no, no. The metrics that we have to measure stuff and to reward ad dollars and all like like if I see an ad on YouTube for Crest toothpaste, I'm not going to click it. I'm going to go to my local CVS and buy Crest toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And that correlation is never, ever quantified anywhere because I can't. Yeah. But if I could find a way to like, you know, if I'm, I like love Crest toothpaste, I could find a way to associate my online profile with Crest toothpaste and get something in exchange for doing that. Cause it's just a bad example. Cause it's like a very low price product, but um, but if I could find a way to like become a Crest ambassador, because I really care about the fact that I have white teeth, then like I have really white teeth and I can be, I can be a real person who is a testament to the fact that their product works. And then that is worth something to the people who are in my circle of people, right? Like it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of convoluted, but you have to get back to like, how do we reward people for recommending products to the people who are in their circle of people? And you can't gamify it. You have to find a way to reward what's already happening. It you also adds reputation to the people as well, though. Hmm? Because a lot of the times right now, like you see, especially on Instagram, I mean, it's you'll have all these people, like I think uh, Fit T was something that all these people oh, were yeah. pumping for the longest time, which nobody actually used it. They were just doing the advertisements because they were being paid from them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, probably, I'm probably getting this wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they had some kind of lawsuit because there was something wrong with the actual tea. Oh, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Oh, it was poisoning people. Oh, I was poisoning people. Yeah. But like, you had all these people like, kind of this thing, like, oh, I drink yeah. fit tea. And then she's like, you know, the ad's done. And she's like, yeah, I don't drink this shit and throws it away. Like it's. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, but that, well, so that now he's, she's just like gone to her whole community, told them something. She's lost clout with her her followers because she yeah. said that she's gonna so then all of her followers are gonna say well why did 
if you're, if you're telling me that this product is good and then you said it was bad, does that mean that this other product that you said is good is also bad and I just don't know it yet? Well, no, she actually never said it was bad, but then come to find out later on that a lot of these people weren't even using it. And like, yeah. there's been influencers that have been found out where, you know, they're- oh, Influencer fraud is a multi-billion dollar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So brand, I think- Brands are getting screwed and like, I'm sorry, like, yes, I should be, you know, down to the big bad, down with the big bad corporation, but it's not that at all. Brands are just trying to find a way to play at the playground. And they've yeah. tried to just take away our ball and it's not working. So they yeah. just, you know, they, sorry, they tried to play ball and they couldn't. So they took away the ball, which is annoying. Yeah. I think that's why it's a running meme though about influencer marketing, quote unquote, or, and then brands that you find only on Instagram per se, that you find these bogus products that aren't really that legitimate or they're oh, like yeah. drop products, yeah. drop shipping, for example. Yeah. And then they just, well, we've even done the same thing with us with advertisement. Like we personally, I mean, we see ads all day and we hate them. It's, it's yeah. intrusive. So we pass them. You say, don't let me yeah. see that. And it'll just show you something else. Yeah. It's intrusive. And it's also something that doesn't seem genuine. So like one of our goals has been with these companies we're working with is how do we create an advertisement? That's not an advertisement. That's yeah. more of an actual engagement. That it's something that even if after you're done with it, you might not want to buy the product still, you still feel like your time, like you yeah. said, your time is valuable. And yeah. you feel like when you were completed with it, you got something from it, at least whether it's an emotional reaction or just, you know, seeing something beautiful created as opposed to, hey, go and buy this at the store and let me show you some fake ad that's everybody's using it and nobody yeah. actually uses it. <laughs> yeah, it's as far as like, <coughs> excuse me, um, like content, content marketing is the future. Content, like being able to, to, um, I mean, product placement has been around for ages, but, but being able to like allow that product to also like if, if a product pays a certain amount to have, you know, the Avengers all use Samsung phones, then yeah. like yeah. Samsung pays a certain amount to put that, to put their product in that movie. And then they probably have some sort of like revenue sharing something or other because they help fund whatever. But, but all of those relationships are so convoluted because they have no idea how the film is going to do. And the only metrics that they use to fill, to just, to discover how the film is going to do are all broken. It's like, I mean, except like yeah. box office traffic is a thing, but we can't go to movie theaters right now. So all of these, all these companies are like, well, what do we do if we'd have a film that's supposed to come out? And it was supposed to have all of this money coming in from the box office. It was supposed to have all of these. And that's still, a, I think that like going to the movies will still be a thing that will come back. Um, but I think the, the value that companies put on when and how someone sees a movie for the first time is going to be way different. So it's going to be really interesting to see. I'm, I'm interested to see which things come back and which things don't, because the way that we communicate is fundamentally changed. It is oh, yeah. completely different than it was eight weeks ago. And we've all learned how to do all kinds of things that are, that are, have enabled us to, to engage in ways we couldn't before or we, we previously did not put a lot of value in before yeah so no, it's, 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 gonna be really it's, definitely, it's definitely forced the world you know all those people that were reluctant to go online it's forced them to have to go online now and adopt technology and move forward with technology yeah i mean with this whole kind of pan, or pandemic and everything how has it affected you know your company obviously like a blockchain is a decentralized company um did it impact you any like normal business i mean was there growth issues after it hit? Like um, so we actually, again, it's a good time. It's a good time to be in video. Um, we actually were able to take advantage of a lot of the layoffs um, because of COVID. We brought on um, two backend engineers, two front end engineers, and three designers um, from companies who laid them off. Um, and we, it's, it sounds bad, but we were able to get, not bad, it doesn't sound bad, but it's, it's we were able to provide an opportunity for these people to go back to work at a very different cost than it would have been if they, you know, were, were coming away from some other company. Yeah. So less um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we were able to, because everyone has nothing but time right now as a small company, people feel that it's less of a risk because what else are they going to be doing? Doing nothing, staying yes. at home, catching up on Tiger King. Like there's like <laughs> only, there's only, there's a limited list of things that people can be doing right now. So if you're, if you're like wanting to start a company or start a podcast or start whatever, like this is the time, like yeah. you are, you have, there has never been a time when like the number of times I have, I have wished that my travel schedule would stop, that my uh, conference schedule would stop, that I could 
you know, leave my job and have some time off to just like, if you're financially stable enough to feed yourself, then like you should be out there starting a company. Everyone should just start a company and try it out. See how it goes. There's all kinds of like money around to do that. Um, maybe not VC money. We actually decided to pause on, on not pause on fundraising, but we had a significant round, um, a uh, significant round committed and then COVID hit and it just didn't just it's paused for now. Um, but we've realized that we could get further with less. And if you can get further with less, then you can really get somewhere with nothing. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a really good time for us. At least we've, we've brought our team a lot. We, our team is a lot bigger now. It's more than doubled in size in the last four weeks. So that's the thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's not sustainable, but it's, that's startup life. If you have four months, you have a year. If you have six months, you have two years. So yeah, um, it's better work. <laughs> so now when, uh, how long are you guys out? Uh, when's your actual launch date? Um, so we launch, it's, it's a beta, so invite only, but you guys are on the invite list. I know a guy. Um, <laughs> So, um, invite only, you can, um, any, I mean, anyone else watching this can subscribe at streambedmedia.com slash subscribe, and then they can see, they can, they can be put on the list to be considered for the beta. Most people will get in anyway, just because it's just requires a little bit more like handholding. Um, okay. and, um, yeah, so we're supposed to launch with, with the post-production content from, uh, from the foundations track of Consensus Distributed, um, the biggest blockchain conference of the year, um, starting to you know do well in our own pond, and then we'll branch out into into some others. So um, we're we're actively bringing on more conferences, more webinars, different. You know, if you have friends who are creating cool content that's really collaborative, then then we want to talk to them and more. And it's not to get them onboarded; it's to just like talk to more and more creators, the more customers, potential customers we can talk to, because they're not even customers; they're users. Like there's no, it just, it's free to publish. It's free to get on board. It's free to participate. Um, just get on and start linking yourself to other people and then we'll figure it out. So. Now, now how does it work with um, like uh, current, like, so obviously we, we're going to have a list of content. We have our client's content. Mm -hmm. um, we can just take that existing content, just bring it right over to your platform and start monetizing so it. We, so we publish to YouTube on your behalf. So you just log in with your YouTube channel or you log in with your, so we are on YouTube and Twitter right now. Um, and you can, I mean, historically, you could historically publish your YouTube content if you wanted to, but it, from a rights perspective, it won't work retroactively. So you could publish your retroactive content and tag people who had participated in all of your libraries of content, but um, it does, that doesn't obviously, that only protects your rights from the date that you um, onboarded to, to Streambed. So it's, okay. it stops it is, people from stealing your videos. That's okay, a big misconception. Is it still uh, able to be monetized though, if you publish previous content on the platform? Well, so the monetization piece is, da is just data, right? We, we are data sharing, data sharing and data linking. Um, we, we do have, people do have wallets on it and you can compensate people through it if you want to, um, but that's, that's a future feature. It's coming out soon. Okay. Soon. Cool. The, the looming soon. <laughs> yeah it'll be like september or later by the time you can you can you, you loop in your creators first and we say okay if you can all share data first then that's great and then if you and then we'll say okay we can all share money later if you can share data then at least we've established the link to be able to do that we've established the rails but then we just need to train okay so if yeah, we no, need I, to establish the rails first and then the train train can come later yeah, I definitely think if there's a way to bring, because uh, I we know like we work with a lot of people who have some pretty extensive content, um, you know, libraries that they've already created. So if there's a way to kind of bring that in and onboard with that, that'd be pretty huge. Because I know a lot of people. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think well, so the, the the best part about it is when you when you upload something uh, via Streambed, you might have to, and unfortunately, you might have to pull it down and republish. But it depends on, you know, you probably obviously don't want to do that because then all your videos publish at the same time. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's up to you. You're the creators to decide whether this is something that you want to like take advantage of for hierarchical content. We haven't figured out how to do it yet. Um, we're all, like new upload only at first, but what happens in the publishing process is you tag other people with their emails. And if they don't have an account with Streamit, they'll just get an email that says you've been tagged in, um, Euphoric's video. Then, um, 
your, that will give you like the, and, and you've been, you know, log in to verify that this is you. And then they have to check that box to say, yes, this was me. And then they're added, their audience can, and then they're given the opportunity to repost or to download to Final Cut to, to uh, edit or to whatever they want to do with it. Um, and you set those terms in, in the publishing process. So we'll see. I can talk about all the things that it's going to be, but I can, uh, that's what it, w it will be able to do soon. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. So. Can, can I ask if there's a process that you're going towards like Facebook and Instagram at all, or is that something that's yeah. not? Yeah, so, so we're, we're in line to, we have to have a working app before we can get into the API sandbox for Instagram. Okay, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we have to, we have to have an app in market. Um, we have to get to mobile first. So it's a web app only right now because um, you publish through your desktop to YouTube, Twitter, and Snapchat. Um, but um, Instagram is mobile first. So we have to have a mobile app first. Okay. okay. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's like a web, it's like a web app that you can use on mobile, but it's not an app yet. Uh, okay. So it's that transition over to our own app. That's, okay. that's next. And I'm assuming that's going with TikTok for in the same. Yes. Mode. TikTok, you also have to have a, a mobile app done. For sure. wow. Before they'll even consider you to, there, before they'll even let you get the API keys, you have to have a mobile app in market, which makes no sense. Yeah. I love how they're strict about their API keys, but not about their content. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, man. Man. I have an awesome, <laughs> awesome video saying. for all my content creator friends that I have to show you, but it's just this girl going around her house like trying to invent new ways to create content because everybody's creating content right now but yeah well I think, it's, I think it's good though because we were even talking about this earlier that even though everybody's creating content right now you're starting to see the consistency of the same content over and over again and you're starting to see the viewership drop because of that because a lot of these fake influencers are getting weeded out yeah and uh, I think really it's going to be like or people who aren't taking time to engage with their audiences. If you're just a pretty girl and you post all of these photos and you never comment back to your people or you never like contribute anything other than your image, then like, okay, cool. But the world doesn't really engage with that. So it, need, it won't have any value in the, in the new world that we're building together. <laughs> you're gonna give all those creeps who dm all the random instagram girls hope yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry, gals. <laughs> sorry gals sorry gals oh man yeah i can't even imagine what yeah yeah no. well cool well, thanks yeah, a lot. this has been an awesome chat it's been oh my god it's been like an hour and a half holy shit yeah no I, mean, I could go on all day with this one because I had like tech, you know, tech is my thing and blockchain and all that, especially. I'm just super excited because this thing is like changing the game. Yeah. In the same time as uh, where everything is changing, it's yeah. almost perfect. Yeah. Hope. Hope is a dangerous thing, sir. Yeah. So I know. I'm a very hopeful person. That's good. That's good. Good. Dangerous. So go yeah. ahead and, and plug all of your, uh, all of your plugs right now so we can get all those in we'll also we'll also link them in the description too so people can find your stuff cool cool um so you can find me on twitter at jenna pilgrim pilgrim uh, like thanksgiving um and uh, you can find me on instagram jenna pilgrimage like a like an adventure that a pilgrim goes on um <laughs> and uh you can find streambed at streambedmedia.com um subscribe to our list at streambedmedia.com forward slash subscribe um and then um, I'm probably forgetting some. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at the stream bed or on Twitter at the stream bed, stream bed. Like I like to stream movies in bed. Um, it's not, that's not where the name came from. The stream bed is at <laughs> the bottom of the river, the like root of the river. So it's like yeah. the origin of knowledge and the origin. Of, if the river is content, then it's, it's, it's very meta. Um, yeah, but it's also a mix of stream and embed. I like that. I like that. Nice. So, there you go. Anyway, um, but yeah, those those are my plugs. Um, and um, yeah, just keep a keep a lookout for us. We have a really fun hike video on our Instagram page, so follow us for updates. We post some fire stories sometimes.